you saw this picture in a gallery, you might walk by it and go, all right, cool. And if you took a closer look, you might say, all right, what's the big deal? But there is something very different about this painting. And that's that it wasn't painted on canvas. It was actually painted directly on top of the man. So I skip the canvas altogether, and I create my painting directly on top of whatever it is I want to paint a picture of. If I'm painting your portrait, I'm literally painting on you, on the clothes, the chair, background. Everything gets covered, including in your ears, because I have to paint your ear on top of your ear. And in this way of mapping the light on the figure, rendering it in my brush strokes, I'm able to transform three-dimensional space into what looks like a two-dimensional painting. And there's no Photoshop here. It's all in the way that I paint in three-dimensional space. And you might be wondering where I went to art school, how did I come up with this idea of turning people into paintings? But really, I'd studied politics. And initially, this project had nothing to do with either people or paint. It was about a sculpture class assignment. Um, I was asked to make a sculpture of a landscape that wasn't a sculpture of a landscape. And I had no idea what this meant. I was asking my professor all these questions, you know, like, is it bigger than a bread box? Is it made with clay, wire, what is it? And he just said, I don't know. That's up to you to figure out. I didn't know where to go with this, but I'd recalled um, the previous spring I'd studied abroad in Denmark, studying European politics, and I was fascinated with the uh, light there and the long shadows on the landscape. And I wanted to figure out a way that I could take that inspiration and turn it into something. Um, so I came up with this idea of capturing the shadows and putting a layer of shadow directly on top of itself. I thought about cutting out a piece of wood in the shape of shadow, painting it black, and putting it down. But that seemed like a lot of work. I just decided it'd be easier to just put paint directly on top of the shadows. And I loved that I could create my own fake shadow that would be hidden within the real one. And the moment the angle of the light changed, my shadow would be revealed. I wanted to think about what else I could put shadows on. And I was still in college, and I asked my friend Bernie, and I said, you know, I want to paint your portrait um, in a shadow on you. And he was like, okay, people paint me all the time, not a big deal. <laughs> and <laughs> it wasn't until I put the first brushstroke of paint on his nose that he was like, whoa, 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 what's happening here? And when I set out to do this, I had a very clear idea of what I thought would happen. I would just paint the uh, highlights and shadows, but then when I took a step back, I saw, yes, I did what I set out to do, but something altogether had manifest before my eyes. And it was something that I couldn't have imagined when I started out, and yet it had perfectly matched my vision. I decided that there was something here that I really wanted to explore. But I'd studied politics, and I'd spent my summers interning on Capitol Hill and working for the Obama campaign, and I'd set out this really neat, nice path for myself to graduate and then go on to Capitol Hill and sit at a desk and have a very long career in government. I made the decision that when I went home from college, instead of going up to the hill, I'd go down to my parents' basement, and I would make it my job to teach myself how to paint. But I didn't want to teach myself to paint on canvas or by copying the old masters, because that's not what this project was initially about. It was about taking real things in space and covering them in a mask. So I spent my days putting paint on things like toast. Um, <laughs> it was nearly impossible, well, and grapefruits, <laughs> apparently. And it was nearly impossible to get the paint to stick to it because the acid would just eat through from the underside. So I had to paint really fast and then quickly take the photo. Um, my parents did not approve of my activities. They thought that I should have a real job. They also didn't like that when they would come home from work, they'd no longer have a fruit bowl, but a painting of a fruit bowl. <laughs> yeah, and if I wanted to paint on models, well, a lot of my friends had nine to five jobs and there weren't many people around. And I was also a little bit embarrassed to bring people down into my basement and show them that I spent my days, you know, painting on fruit. And if I wanted a model, it would oftentimes be myself. It <laughs> is way more challenging than putting on makeup because not only, you know, do I have to paint around my eyes with a clunky paintbrush and acrylic paint, but also I have to figure out how to get the back of my neck and angle the mirrors and see around myself. 
And it's really hard to get distance from the artwork when you're physically the work. You have to look at your painting through your own eyes, back at yourself. Another model that I used that I um, was able to get a hold of in the early days was an elderly man who uh, was a really great sport about being painted, but an even better sport about being photographed. This gentleman didn't mind being taken out to be photographed in unusual places, like on the tube. And it was really fun, like taking painting out of its typical context from this static canvas and making it something that now it could walk by you and take a look. And in addition to the tube, taking it out into the street, putting my own little twist on street art. I wanted to do more though than, um, I wanted to play with perception more and warp your expectations of what you were seeing to a greater extent. And so I took one of my normal painting styles, this was my older sister, and I thought about photographing her reflection in a warped mirrored surface. And I found this piece of foil. And I found that when I photographed her, it turned into this warped image without Photoshop. And depending on the different angles, it would turn into something else altogether. I started working on some other uh, side projects while I was doing this, um, exploring shadows again. And I came together with the collaborator, Sheila Vand. And looking back at my reflection work, um, we had the idea of taking her bathtub, painting her, and then photographing her reflection in the bathtub. And we found that if we photographed uh, just the water and flipped it upside down, then it would create this dynamic portrait that would also be changing. But in addition to uh, playing with the reflections in the water, we had the idea of using a more opaque surface that uh, she could submerge under in the bathtub. And what we decided to use was milk. We loved that we had this opaque liquid canvas that she could hide under it, it could conceal the body and change the shape of it altogether. We wanted to see what else we could do with the milk, um, but we weren't really sure how it would behave. And we decided to set up a little test kitchen uh, to see what sorts of um, patterns we can make. Like, we would fill up water balloons with food coloring and milk and then pop them underwater, or drizzle in uh, pixie dust and put instant pudding on the top so that it would clump up and create interesting textures. And when it eventually came time to painting Sheila in full color and then having her come into the milk, the results were always completely unexpected. Um, I could have a very specific image of what I want it to look like, and I could start painting her in that way. But the moment she'd go down into the milk, it would completely transform beyond either my control or hers. We could try to push it in a certain direction, but inevitably the milk would take it elsewhere. And if we wanted to um, counteract the milk washing the paint off of her body, we could have the water level really low. But in this piece, to get that effect, we actually did a lot of the painting on her back. So she would sit up, I'd put yellow paint all over her, she'd lay back down, and it would send a little shock wave of yellow around. She'd sit up, put blue paint on, and over and over to create these kind of concentric tree rings of color that would swirl around her. And oftentimes, we would have complete disaster happen in this process. I would paint her, the moment she'd get in the milk, it would all wash off and I wouldn't even be able to get off a single shot. Um, and sometimes we would still try to get the shot even though it appeared that there was nothing there to capture. And we'd have to come up with these solutions in the moment, like if the milk washed all the paint off of her arms, okay, we'll just hide your arms. And if it washed all the paint off of her face, well then, okay, just hide your face. Which, these are really clunky solutions like the same thing that you know a frustrated kid would do when he can't draw hands, just like put them in the pocket. But it accounted for some of our most elegant artwork despite these um, makeshift like moments of decision making. And we couldn't have necessarily foreseen that that's where it would have gone when it started out. And likewise, when I first started out with this sculpture assignment, I didn't know that it would take me to my interest in shadows and that from this sketch, I would all of a sudden go to putting paint on people and painting people in a pool of milk. But I think that there's just something really magical about asking questions that 
you're not asking to end in a certain way, but you're asking them to open up further possibilities. Because if my sculpture professor had asked me to make a sculpture of a landscape, you know, using clay, then I might not have come upon this. Or if he told me to make a sculpture of a landscape using paint, I would have said, I'm not a painter. I don't know how to do this. But because he did leave enough room in the assignment, I was able to create questions with answers broader than I could have possibly imagined and ended up with more than could possibly meet my imagination. Thank you. Yeah.